Good, uh, good morning. This is uh, Mark's Musings, and uh, I'm Mark, and we are here broadcasting at uh, WCTV in Wilmington, Massachusetts, and we're pleased to have with us today a, a local author by the name of Jean Tronstein, who I met at a uh, author's fair at the Tewksbury Library about a year ago, and then also recently at the Wilmington Library, uh, where the writers group invited her to give a discussion on uh, how to uh, publish a, uh, a book. So uh, we're very pleased to have her. Good morning. How are you? Good. Nice, nice to be here. Nice to see you again, Jean. Thank you, Mark. Very good. Um, well, we're very pleased to have you here. I guess the weather has been a little cooperative today. It's a little cold out, but at least it's not snowing or raining yet. <laughs> but uh, we've uh, had a little break in the weather. So, uh, what I like, I know that you have written uh, recently, you have your, uh, your book out, uh, The um, Boy with a Knife. And, uh, but yet, before we get there, I'd like to talk a little bit about your background and uh, how you got started. So could you just tell me a little bit about uh, uh, what got you started in writing? Um, it's a funny question in a way because it really starts with um, being a kid and just you know looking out the window and seeing a tree and writing a poem and um, thinking I could capture things with words in some way. Sure. I, yeah. yeah, and then I guess I, I was also really interested in theater, and I pursued that for a long time and went to Hollywood, was an actress. But, and then I had the experience of seeing a theater production in a prison that was actually touring outside, and I was very taken by it. And one thing led to another, and I was offered fairly, you know, a couple of years after that, an opportunity to teach in a prison. Isn't that wonderful? It wow. was, and yeah. so I think it was the desire to speak about what I saw. Oh yes, yes. That yeah. propelled me into writing. Yes, yes. And I, I, I think I, I said that to the Wilmington Writers Group also is that when you have something to say, yes, that is. I think one of the motivators. Um, Most important, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. to, when you uh, have something that's uh, pent up in your mind and you want to get it out to tell people about it, that's that's the motivating uh, factor. Right. So the first book I actually wrote was Shakespeare Behind Bars, but that took a long time yes. to get to that book. Y yeah. 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 And, and when you did wrote that book, uh, did you teach uh, the prisoners about acting, about writing? About well, I mean, I was teaching college classes in the prison. Oh, okay, yes. And, <coughs> excuse me, I, after about five years, I was teaching writing classes, literature classes, and acting classes. Oh, yes. Yeah. And after, well, actually, I don't even think it was five years. It, it was, uh, five years was when I started writing the book, but after one year, um, the one of the women said we need to do a play uh -huh, yeah. and that got I have a theater background and I couldn't imagine doing a play in prison but we did and then and that was done for the women inside it was done for people on the outside Wow! and the first play was a Shakespeare play because uh -huh. my thinking is that if you give people something that they think is most difficult for them to do and they succeed they really feel yeah better about this. Accomplish something. Yeah. something. Yeah. So I ended up um, starting to write about my experiences in prison yeah. with the women and that led to my first book, Shakespeare Behind Bars. Um, led to some articles and then How, how often did you uh, visit the prison? Was it a daily thing? Or no. What, uh, it was about twice a week. Twice a week, yeah. And then you got to know some of the, the oh, people yeah. there and and uh, so the book is based around six women. Six women, okay. Yeah. And they all took on different parts in the Shakespeare right. plays and whatever, yeah. And so it took them time to learn their parts and... Uh, well, I know. directed the play yeah. and it took us six months, wow. really. 
Um, I brought in Shakespearean costumes for them to try <laughs> on. They adapted the text. We did Merchant of Venice, the trial scene. Oh my God! And yes, it was very profound. Wow. And we invited people from the outside, and we had gotten a grant for this, um, and that led to seven more plays. So I ended wow. up ultimately directing eight yeah. plays yeah. in the women's prison. The book only covers. Um, Merchant of Venice because I, I bet yeah. they felt a sense of pride, all of them, oh, you yeah. know, in terms of you know, being able to do something that they had never done before and and uh, under your direction, you know, but uh, it was right. nice, yeah. So that was kind of what, and then I was hooked after that in terms of writing. Yes, um, yeah, I can see. Yeah. see his, uh, and so then you got, uh, you wrote several other articles and magazines and things like that, but now you're you discovered this story about a uh, boy who stabbed somebody. And well, what happened was, okay, so I had written several other books in between. Yes. Um, and uh, some of them, a lot of things had to do with the justice system, but some things didn't. Anyway, a young man wrote me from prison. Oh, yes. And asked me for help oh, okay. of, a, a, for a female friend of his on parole issues. and. Um, I didn't know that much about parole at the time, but I began researching, and that's what, after, a, you know, I was very interested in his case, what yes. happened with him. Yes. He had yes. killed someone when he was 16. Oh my God, yes. And it was in a classroom, and mm. since I'm a teacher, he killed some, I, mean, I teach college, yes. he had killed someone in a academic setting, that was, I couldn't understand that. So I started researching him. What happened? Yes. And yeah. as I started writing him, and the discrepancy between the person on the page who wrote me and what was said about him was so profound that I <laughs> wanted to understand that. Yes, That's yes. what led me into writing yeah. Boy with a Knife. Wow, wow, yeah. And so now he served, uh, he was commi uh, committed to prison. and He was served. sentenced for life. And, and he actually was with the eligibility of parole. He um, ultimately, when he wrote me, he had to serve 15 years. Wow. But we ended up writing, took him another five years to get out, and he ended up writing for those five and a half years while he was mm -hmm. behind bars the mm -hmm. whole time. And mm -hmm. um, it was on the basis of his letters and my research into parole, uh, was kind of the book, yeah, I, I read somewhere along the lines that he even studied law as well. He was in prison. And well, well, you know, a lot of guys behind bars um, become jailhouse lawyers, and yes. they do that because they're interested in their own cases. Yeah, of course. And other guys don't have maybe reading ability, and they're interested in having help on their cases. Yeah. So Carter did get into studying some things with law. With I mean, he, he wasn't. I mean, he studied in order to understand enough to. Yes. Yeah try to protest some of the things that happened to him and yeah. ultimately um, he was able to find a pro bono lawyer who got him out. Oh, um, wow, wow, yeah. Uh, which yeah. was a settlement with the parole board. And I noticed that he uh, also sued the parole board or something along the lines that he had, and that because he kept on getting right. turned down right. or something. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so the settlement, um, he, they didn't have to go to trial. Yeah. And the settlement is, um, but he's still on parole for life. Oh yes. And um, it was it was a you know a very important experience in many ways for me to be so connected to one person. I had been connected to people with Shakespeare behind bars, but with Carter, and he's out now doing well, married, living in Maine, oh, wow, uh, wow. as a job. Yeah. In somewhat, I mean, he's somewhat very ordinary, and he's somewhat very extraordinary. Yes, of course. It, it's hard to uh, imagine uh, how does he pick up the pieces once you get out, and what kind of career do you uh, uh, explore? You know, kind of, kind of skills do you have? That type of thing. You know? Right. And uh, so I'm glad that he's uh, he's doing well, yeah. like you know, I, as well as can be expected, I guess. Yeah. And, and it's nice that you were able to uh, explore all this. Uh, now, how long did it take you to actually, when once you got the letter from Cotter, to finally writing something about it? Did it take you uh, months, years, or? 
Well, I think I got, I, I'm trying to remember the timeline, but... Um, did you visit Potter in jail? Or? I did visit yeah. him. Yeah. Um, well, the first time I visited him was when I took my students to see him um, in a group he was in called Project Youth, and they heard a bunch of guys talk about, excuse me, their remorse. Oh, yes. And what had happened to them and how they changed and stuff. This was at, when he was at Shirley yes. Prison. And Why did he get moved around? Why, why well, they do that. That's yeah. just it's, um, part of the system. They okay. move you. They decide okay. different things. I mean, it's, it's always very, in many cases, it feels random for the prisoner. You know, sometimes they think there's somebody else at the prison. We don't want two, these two people at the same place. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah. In Carter's case, you know, he was at pre-release, he was about to get out, and then he almost, I mean, he had gotten parole, he was about to get out, he had, they found glucosamine chondroitin, which is a supplement, but they thought it was drugs, uh, drugs yeah. and they didn't check first, and they sent him immediately to oh, Old geez. Colony Correctional, yeah. so, you know, he moved a lot, but um, I was going to say that... Um, you asked me how long it took me, and I would say, you know, the book was published in 2016, so it was a good, I don't know, eight years, seven years, something like that. Wow, yeah. But, but I wrote, it, it, I, I didn't wait to write until he was out. I started writing the book before he was out, yeah. when I was interested in his case, and he knew, I asked him permission, he knew I was writing about him, yeah, yeah. but, um, and I read the trial transcripts, etc., but neither of us knew if he was going to get out, which affected yeah. the way I wrote the book. In the end, the book has an epilogue by Carter. Okay, yes. But yeah. he was, and he wrote the epilogue after he was out. Okay, all right, yeah, so the it, there's an explanation uh, in the epilogue. Yeah, interesting. So, uh, so you met Carter through through the uh, letter, through letters, and then you visited him, and then you began to do your research. Uh, uh, you had uh, also technical research that you had to do too. Right. You probably contacted different people to. Oh, I had bazillion interviews. I had. I mean, I have four hundred and. 50 some odd footnotes in the oh book. My God, yes, I mean, yeah. it's a narrative, but yeah. I wanted it to have all the research behind it because. Of course, yeah. And, and in a way, the story is unusual in that I enter the book a couple of times as the narrator enters the book. Yes. I'm the narrator, I enter the book, and at the same time, it's Carter's story, it's his narr it's, it's about him. And at the same time, it's research. Okay. So yeah. it's it's a combination of things that I think is somewhat unusual. And then it has the epilogue by Carter. Um, he it was interesting when I had him read the book. I didn't have him read the book until it was done. <laughs> yeah. Because, a, I didn't really want to get into something where he would go. That's not right. That's not right. That's not right. That's not right. <laughs> All of that. <laughs> and on the other hand. I think um, if there had been something majorly wrong, he would have told me. Yeah, yeah. Um, obviously, a lot of things are perspective. He said his reaction was, I wonder if people will think I'm a believable character. Oh. <laughs> Which was an interesting response. Yeah, yeah. wow. Mm -hmm. it, it, thinking that it was more mm -hmm. fiction than uh, real. Yeah. Well, but you know, I made it sound, I mean, the book is. When you write good, I mean, I think if you're a good writer and you write narrative nonfiction, yes, um, you better write it like fiction. Now, everything uh, Carter is his real name. Yeah. Uh, yes. Okay. So our, everything that you wrote is pretty much uh, uh, factual. It's not. Yeah. It's, you know, it's not. I had to change a few names. Okay. Yeah. Because I didn't have permission from some people, and also. There were some things, and I took out some things I might have said that I didn't say, even though they were true, just because I was afraid they would be too provocative and yes. other people would be too upset about yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes you have to think about people's feelings, you know, when you write something. Right. You're, 
artist. Right. You know, is it uh, is it something that people really want to hear about? You know, and does it add to your story too? Like, to yeah. I mean, I did have trouble. The, the victim's family was very upset about this. The person who Carter's killed, his yes. sister. Oh yes. They're upset about the book, and um, I went. You know, I I at one reading, I did talk with them, and I. The sister particularly was very angry, understandable. I mean, not, she didn't want the book to come out. She didn't want there to be a book about the person who killed her brother. Yes, yes, of course. And I understood that, and I yeah. also understood, and it was hard to explain to her, that he had a story that was also worth telling. Yes, yeah. And, yeah. The, you know, the truth is most of the narrative, most news stories are, at least at the time when I was writing the book, were about the victim side of the story, yeah, and yeah. now we have more stories which show how people get into crime, what happens, the remorse, you know, how we can heal. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the sad things in the state is that we don't really insist on what I what is called restorative justice. Yeah, we have revengeful justice in a way. In other words. People are adversarial all the time. It's always adversarial, and in, you know Carter's not allowed to talk to the family of, even write a letter to the family of the yeah. victims, mm -hmm. and they don't they, they don't contact him. And there's no way to have an, any. In restorative justice, they often have healing circles where people get to meet other people, even if it's not the exact family. The victims get to meet other people who've killed people, or they get to have their feelings expressed and get to work through things mm -hmm. in yeah. a very healing way. We don't necessarily promote that. Sometimes it happens, but... What, what's, uh, you mentioned that there was uh, something wrong with the parole system. Oh my God. Uh, <laughs> so, so, Mark, that was an understatement that you just said. <laughs> And so there are many things wrong with the parole many system. Things, Do you want yeah. me to list five of no, them? You know, <laughs> right, well, one anyway. Just uh, it did, what did Carter find that was preventing him from getting parole? Well, I, I want to say something more global about the parole okay. system. I think um, the problems are that um, a lot of people are judged when they come up for parole for their crime again rather than for the work they've done since they went to prison. Oh, okay, yes. That's one problem with parole, particularly with lifer hearings. Mm -hmm. um, another problem with parole is there are so many parole hearings that they the parole board is ridiculously overworked and they take 10 to 12 months often to get out the decisions. Wow. And in Carter's time, it was less, so that was better. But... Um, you know, there's. It's like parole. There's a problem now with too many quote law enforcement types on parole boards, rather than enough psychologists, people who are social workers, people who understand addiction, people who understand juvenile justice. We have a problem with that. There's a problem with um, no. You know, the some of the racial dis disparity of the parole board. There's like one person of color right now, but uh, there there have been two at a time, but often there aren't enough people who are diverse in different ways. Yes, like yeah. Educationally, backgrounds, etc. Training, mm -hmm. um, as well as racially. Um, so, I mean, it's, we have a seven-member board to judge 8,000 hearings that are some lifers, uh, you know, 200 lifer hearings. Is that how many hearings there are? And about 8,000, 200 of them are lifer, but about 8,000 hearings, or seven, 8,000 hearings across the state. And they per, have to travel to different prisons wow. to, to, for, for people who are in, who are not on li yeah, uh, lifetime yeah. parole, who are yeah. on, you know, say, you know, What's the percentage crimes, of uh, pr uh, parolees that get paroled? Or well, the if you look at um, adults versus juveniles, it's different. But the overall percentage is it's about twenty three percent mm -hmm. right now. Yeah, it varies. That's not great. Yeah, it's not. Yeah. And yeah. parole actually, it, you know, if you have good supervision and you're out of prison, yeah, it's better for the country. It's better for the state. It's better for everybody. Yeah. 
um, because being in, I mean, prison is not a healthy environment. Yeah, you, you would hope that uh, during their prison stay that they learned the um, uh, bad things about their, their, their crime, but then they learned uh, remorse and they learned how to uh, get better. The and thing, so Mark, is that most people have to work against a system that does not give them support. In yeah. other words, the system does not support that learning. Yeah. But people like Carter and many other young men and women do change and do, um, I mean, some of the reasons people get into crime are very much about poverty. It's not just about their own personal experiences. Yeah. I mean, not to say if you're poor you're going to get into crime, but we kind of ignore sometimes the systemic reasons that yeah. Yeah. people get into crime. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that you go to prison doesn't change what's going to happen to you when you get out and when you're in the same situation you were as you went back in. So defeating, if you're yeah. poor when yeah. you go in, you're certainly probably not going to be anything but poor when you get out. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so those, there are a lot of how do you change that? Right. Yeah. That's yeah. Yeah. that's so. The question is not just about personal responsibility, although that's important. It's yeah. also about our responsibility mm -hmm. as a society yeah. to people who, you know, who are not as fortunate as yeah. say we so are. So one of the better things about the parole or the prison system is to try to teach the prisoners to. Uh, learn a new trade. I wouldn't say the bet that's a better thing about the prison system. No, what I'm saying is, yeah, yeah is that uh, while they're there, they needed to teach them how to survive. In well, they don't learn that from the system. That's what I'm telling you. They yeah. learn it in spite of the system. Yeah. Uh, there are some skills people can learn behind bars. Not very many. Yeah. When I was at Framingham, there was a program called Women in the Building Trades, and they wouldn't allow the women to have tools. Oh. You know, um, you know, women learn how to do nails. It's not like um, there's a lot going on for people to yeah. learn when yeah. they're inside. Yeah. Um, Bar Carter got his barber's license, but he wasn't able to practice because um, in order when he got out, he would have to pay, uh, not his license, he got his barbering certificate, but to get a barber's license would have cost a lot of money that oh, he didn't yeah. have, yeah. so he couldn't do that. Oh my God! Yeah. So, it's, so there's, it, there's a lot hurdles, of catch twenty twos. Yeah. Yes, yeah, hurdles that prevent. I mean, there are people and programs that are trying to help people when they get out. Yeah. There are people and programs that are trying to help people when they're inside. It's not a hundred percent bleak. I mm. don't want to say that. Yeah. But, w but it's very much fighting against a system that is not set up to help people. It and it's a system that is only set up to cage people. Oh, yeah, that's too bad. That's too bad, yeah. So. But yeah. I am what is called um, a prison abolitionist. I would like to see the system that we have changed. Okay. How? How would it be? Well, I mean, it wouldn't be like we let everybody out in two <laughs> seconds. But I think that there are a lot of people, number one, who are behind bars who don't need to be there. Okay. Enormous amount of people who yeah. we could figure out, like, if we could have many people out, our sentencing structure is ridiculous. I mean, to send people necessarily to prison for, you know, not not so much in Massachusetts, but some states, life eligibility for parole in 50 years, I mean, that's insane. You know, <laughs> you're going to be 105, you know. So um, our sentencing structure is too harsh. It's too, yeah. Yeah. Um, Recently, we got rid of, I mean, we still have the death penalty in a lot of states. Mm. Um, we still have life without parole, which I don't agree with. Yeah. I think everybody should have the chance of parole. The chance of parole doesn't parole. mean you're going to get it. Yeah. yeah. Because as I said, the parole board is very hard. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the chance to go before the parole board. Mm. Um, I think that in some countries across the world, people who quote, guard people are trained for a year, as just like they're, psycho you know, they're social workers. Mm. We don't train 
are correction officers. Yeah. So, I mean, they're trained perhaps in, you know, custody, quote, they call it care, but it's really more of how to keep people from um, doing something yeah. they think is wrong, but not taking, not giving them support. Inter interesting, yeah. So, um, but so we could talk about this for a long time. <laughs> forever, forever. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay, so now you have this book, and you now, uh, I've spent a long time researching it, talking with Cotter, putting, putting the words together, and now you have uh, a full manuscript. How do you get it published? Um, well, each book I've had has had a different different process to publication. Yes. There has been nothing one way. With um, Boy with the Knife, I had a publisher. They were public. I mean, I got them just by happenstance. Um, I tried to get an agent. I had had agents for my other books, yes. and they sold. And um, that's how I got a publisher. But with with Boy with the Knife. I tried to get an agent. Nobody was really interested in taking oh, the book yes, because yes. an agent doesn't take your book unless they think they can make money from your book. Yeah, of course, yeah. And this was a book that they didn't think was going to be, you know, a gigantic big seller. Interesting, yeah. Um, but for a small publishing company, it was a gigantic, not a gigantic. It did what it's done well. Yeah. So I got this. I found out about social justice publishers, basically, and the publishing company that I ultimately went with was uh, is called IG, IG, IG Publishing, um, and they're out of New York, and they do a lot of really good books that try to change the world, mm, and I liked them. And I think they decided they'd publish my book because I said to them, listen, <coughs> um, you know, I know you have, I mean, I didn't say this, but I knew they didn't have tons of money to send me on a book tour. Yes. Yeah. And um, I said, I'll go around to 10 cities and I'll wow. do books readings wow. and I'll yeah. sell this book. Because I found, A, that is fun. And be the way to get attention to your book is to go to different cities. Yes. And then a radio show, they'll do a radio show, yeah. somebody will do this and that. So I brought a lot of attention to the book um, with the by tour. traveling with, with it. With the tour. And um, I think also, uh, there, as Carter got out of prison, um, people got interested also because of this book and they wanted Carter to talk. And Carter is incredibly articulate. And so, you know, some classes use the book and have Carter come to speak or something Oh, so like he that. does do that. He does some Yeah, speaking. he does speaking. And he yeah. also, right. he writes letters, um, you know, when he doesn't agree with policies. He, he would love to go inside. I think he'd be a fantastic person. You know, they have a rule that you can't go inside uh, when you've been a... Uh, somebody who's committed a crime unless you get special permission. It's very hard. You have to go through a number of years and training and so on. Um, but he'd be a wonderful person to help people when they come out to help them to say, share his experience and yes. then yeah. help people. Yeah. I always, he has, he finished community college. When he got out, oh, yeah. he yeah. immediately, I helped him get yeah. enrolled at Quinn Sigmund Community College and he got a 4.0 average. Wow, wow, very motivated, yeah. Right. yeah very I'd nice. like him to go to a four-year school, but sure. you know, yeah. I'm pushing him a little. Yeah. <laughs> so I've noticed now, uh, you, so you've pushed your book uh, by going on tour. Yeah. And you're continuing to do that too because you're trying to get people interested in the book, and so you're making and the subject in in the subject mm -hmm. and making appearances at mm -hmm. libraries and mm -hmm. and uh, bookstores, mm -hmm. etc. So, so how's that going? Is that going pretty well now that you keep you keep it in the public's eye? Well, yeah. I mean, it's not like you know, I'm not John Grisham. Yeah, <laughs> of course. You know, I mean. Yeah. You don't. I don't ask for myself, or my publisher doesn't ask for me. You know more books than they expect. You know it, it did well for them. Yeah, th my book, Good. and Good. I think um, they were happy with it, and I was happy with it, am happy with it, and you know people now ask me. 
you know, like I'm doing a, um, a Martin Luther King keynote on juvenile justice. Um, I think I mentioned this to you. I went to Italy this year and yes, yeah. um, got an award for my doing theater and literature in prison. And um, one of the people there has committed to translating um, Shakespeare behind bars and perhaps Boy with a Knife into oh, Italian. Oh, nice! Yeah, so that yeah. would be interesting. Yeah, you know, get more readers that way. Yeah. Um, I I I think that I tell people about juvenile justice and it, it's it's a resource. It's yeah. a resource for why we should not send children to adult prisons. So it's sort of a platform for you to. To, to talk, talk about, about yeah, I think reform, that, yes. I think that Carter's story helps us understand more, kids in general. Yeah. And it helps us, helps us understand why teens should not be put in with adults. Not that I think teen facilities are particularly good, but adult facilities, imagine being a 16-year-old and being sentenced to an adult prison. Yeah. I mean, you don't go in this state until you're over 18, but yeah. if you're sentenced, even if you're 18, I think you're still pretty young. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's not not a good environment for them. To Actually, 18 now is still considered a child, so you'd have to be 19 to go to an adult prison. But yeah, the yeah. problem is that, and, and we're trying to pass laws to get 21 to be considered uh, a, a uh, child, not a child, but a youth, and you know your brain's not fully developed. I mean, I there there you know it'd, it'd be better um, if younger people are not with adults. Bill Ricca has a program in other places, that's a jail though, it's a house of correction, where they have, you know, some young people isolated from other yeah. people in the jail and, yeah. and to sort of more programming, more uh, connected to age appropriate. Yeah, connected to. Inter interesting. So what's next? Uh, are you still th you're thinking about writing another book? I or? am writing another yeah. book. Okay, good. Very I good. am writing another book, and um, is it in a similar vein, or is it something different? Or well, um, I don't know if I want to talk about it. Okay, yeah, no problem. I will say a couple of things. So, okay. yeah. one is, it's challenging. I always challenge myself, and it, this one is short stories. Okay, good. And good. so, it involves stuff with the criminal justice system. All right, All but right. it's good. short stories. Very, very good. Very good. So your book is available on uh, Amazon? Yeah, everywhere, and, anywhere. And, and everywhere. And so it's called? The Boy with a Knife. Boy with a Knife. Um, a story of murder, remorse, and a prisoner's fight for justice. Very good, very good. Well, I think we have come to the close okay. of our uh, interview. We've talked about 30 minutes here now. And uh, you've been very interesting. I always loved uh, listening to you. Uh, you always have something new to Thank add you. to your uh, to, to your story. And uh, I'm glad that uh, Cotter is doing well. And he's now has a new life. And uh, um, and he's uh, progressing. And, and I'm glad that the uh, the book is doing has done well too. And uh, and then now that you're off to some new new ventures too, and it's nice to hear you uh, travel around and uh, you've made quite a journey uh, from this uh, book here, mm -hmm. not only uh, locally but now you've gone to Europe and uh, and uh, so it looks like uh, this has been a, quite a, a learning endeavor for you and for the general public. I would like to say if people want to know more about my work, they can go to my website, which is oh, yes, www.jeantrounstein.com. Yeah. I'm also on Twitter, um, at Justice with Jean, and I am someone who really likes to help people and I'm willing to answer questions. I don't, you know, I'm not somebody who says, don't talk to me. <laughs> say, you know, if you have a question or you want some advice about something. So I, on those I, websites, they could leave comments and you could... No, no, they can't leave comments. Okay. I, I tried that for a while, and it, what happens is you get so many bots, uh, B-O-T-S, you know, uh, non-real people, oh, yeah. that uh, it was ridiculous. Oh, you yeah, know, people who, who are human yeah. beings. Yeah. So I don't do questions on that, but, but um, 
I have a it, 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 on Twitter and, and on my website. It does give um, you know email chance to or say yeah. something. Yeah, very good. Email. And do you write the blogs too? You write a blog? Yeah. yeah. Well, the Justice with Jean blog okay, yeah. is on my website. On your yeah. website, yeah. Very good. Well, very good. Thank you very much for uh, being with us today, and uh, that. Uh, has brought the program to a close and we're very happy to have you and we look forward to seeing more of your writing and hearing more about about you so again I'd like to uh, uh, bring the program to a close so this is Mark's Musings and uh, we are broadcasting at WCTV in Wilmington Massachusetts and uh, we were uh, proud to have with us today Gene Tronstein, who uh, has written several books, and you can get them on Amazon, and also uh, go to her websites uh, and her bl blog. Uh, so with that, uh, thank you very much, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye now.